Live from the UK, broadcasting around the world. Around the world. You're listening to the Mike Drop Club, hosted by Douglas Hammond Dishe. Message received. Message received. You do not need to know what you need. What you need. Just engage with the podcast feed. Just engage with the podcast feed. Providing weekly insights into cool stuff we've read, saw, did, or heard about what made us say, wow, eureka, damn, nothing is off limits. If it motivates and inspires you to reach your goals, then it shall be discussed. Featuring guest interviews from high performers and people of influence and weekly awards for the best mic drop moment. This podcast is guaranteed to leave you pumped up for the week ahead. Don't just live life, make life boom. How you doing guys out there? You all right? Today I am again blessed. I've managed to get in the house Jack Jacobs. This is a guy who definitely doesn't live life through limits. This is a guy who at the age of 25 is running his own company that's worth close to a million pounds, okay? Now, Jack Jacobs is not your ordinary individual, I'll tell you that right now. He's somebody that literally makes life boom. So I'm honored that I could have him on this show. Just give us a breakdown in terms of what he's been up to and who is this Jack Jacobs? The company that he runs is involved with um, public sector and health sector events. They're called the Partnership Network Events Company. They're based in Gatwick, or just shy of Gatwick, and um, they're making large inroads. In fact, they are the, the de facto, de facto um, company to be engaged with if you're put on any events in regards to health or public sector. So the journey that he's been on, at 10 to age of 25, when I look at him, all I see is my little nephew, um, <laughs> he's, he's that young, um, to hold that um, credibility and that responsibility is no mean feat. So there's, is there, he's here to share with you guys some sh- um, pearls of wisdom, things that has inspired him, things that really made him go, mm, and I'm also going to ask him his mic drop moments because that's what this show is about, finding out what key moments um, do high-performing individuals overcome and how do they go to that go to that place to overcome those challenges so that they can share them with you and we can all learn and build together so so jack how you been very good mate very good yeah. how are you i'm fine i'm i'm, I'm superb Thanks. i'm more nervous than you trust me uh, yeah well i don't know i don't know <laughs> no, no, no. so yeah how's your week been yeah What's good it? yeah good so uh good week so far um getting ready to go to uh our next healthcare event in the next five weeks so all hands to the deck all systems to go um, prepping, 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 and uh, making sure that it's going to be the success it needs to be. Now, for, for those of you who don't understand um, events, if, um, promotions, and marketing, these are these um, probably they're put on every, every two, three times of the year. And there are large events whereby you get industry heads, professionals, key people of influence in one room talking about matters that um, affect the industry and also allow them to network exactly with that. other like-minded people. So it's not an easy feat getting these people in a room together in a large auditorium together. So how do you, about, how do you go and do, how do you go about doing that? Hard work, hard, hard work. Um, so, so yeah, just in, in terms of what you said there, it's, it's not easy because we're quite strict on the level that is allowed to attend our events. So they have to be decision makers. They have to be chief director, heads of department, um, ultimately people that have a say in their organization and that can make transformation happen. Um, we then bring those together so they can benchmark and network and share best practice. Um, I think everyone's on a, a same kind of, everyone's on, a, on, on, the, on the, the, the journey to the same goals and that's say healthcare, for example, better in patient care or increasing efficiencies internally, becoming more financially stable and so on. Um, but but all are on very different journeys to get there. And, and some are at that end stage, some are at the start, some are midway through. Um, and so it's about sharing those stories, but warts and all. And it's got to be warts and all because it's not now all about flashy lights and shiny kit and sure. uh, everything being all all good all the time because it's just not the case and, and it's not how the real world works. Um, so we're quite hot on that. And, you know, we've brought together some of the leading chief executives, um, 
within the NHS, for example, in local authorities, in higher education institutions that have come down and shared really inspiring transformational journeys. Um, so, so that's what we do. And that's what we're working towards um, in, uh, in, in November. And we've got a, a group of around a hundred similar people. So CIOs and chief nurses and chief executives and coups and directors of operations and so on coming together so they can, like I said, benchmark and network and, and, and uh, share best practice, but also then to meet with roughly 20 um, innovating solution providers that can help them along those journeys also. Yeah, and I understand that because um, I'm in the same field. Yeah. Um, it's been a difficult time the last few years um, in the event space for health and, and, and I guess in the um, public sector as well it's because a, there was a, a deluge sat- of different events to it's go to. It's a saturated to. market, exactly that. It's a saturated market and I think we, you've got to come with something different. Um, too many are same in. You've got the same speakers telling the same stories, telling the same journeys and it's almost you get them people on the event wheels mm. um, and I, I really try hard to avoid them because... The, the, serial, the serial guest speaker. Exactly. You know who you are. The serial guest speaker that you see at every anyone. event showing and presenting the same PowerPoint presentations. Um, yeah. So how do you keep your um, events fresh and, and engaging and adding extra value when you know it's a saturated market? Sure. Um, so I try and think outside the box a bit. Um, so, for example, you know, I try and do stuff around not just excellence, but people that are on that, as I said before, a journey to excellence. Um, and so, for example, I had uh, one of the newest chief execs in the country, James Devine, who's the chief exec of Medway, come down and, and host the keynote. And and that organization has historically been um, a troubled organization. Yes. Um, but, you know, are on a, an amazing journey to excellence now and, and, and you know, are, are doing some amazing things. And so, um, and, and then on the likewise, we had Steve Dunn um, come along, um, who's the chief executive of, of West Suffolk, um, who are an outstanding CQC organization or a GDE site. Um, for those that don't know, it's a global digital exemplar site. So um, I've given kind of extra funding from uh, NHS England to, to lead innovation and, and become the blueprint. Um, and so it's about bringing both stories together and, and, you know, both are incredible people in their own right. Um, and, and are on, and have incredible stories about their organization and their journeys and so on and so forth. Um, we also look to bring together, you know, it's not just so many of these events are just around it and, and, and this is again, across the public sector portfolio, not just healthcare. Um, Transformation can't happen with just IT. Mm. You've got to have exactly. operational, clinical, or service heads bought into that for, for real transformation exactly. to happen. Exactly. Um, when they're too IT led, or they're too clinically led, or they're too operationally led, they fail because you haven't got the the, the key buy in from the other. And, and I think you know most projects fail based on buy in and based most on change. Um, so and most definitely, if I could just pick up on that um, point about transformation. Mm. Um, Too many times within the health sector, we talk about digital transformation, clinical transformation, when all all what we talk about in reality is a change Mm. in process because true transformation is similar to David Attenborough's example of of a caterpillar cocooning itself for a period of time then turning into a butterfly. A butterfly bears no resemblance to what it was before the caterpillar. Uh, but if you look across the NHS in most health environments, they're literally operating the same by using technology. So it's not true transformation as such, because again, in terms of what Jack is alluding to, not all the pieces of the puzzle are brought together at the right time to then Im- impact that change to make it truly transform- transformation. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> it. I was struggling with that word there. Yeah. But yeah, that, this is, this is something I, I see the, uh, the synergy there because as a clinician myself, I see it all the time when I, when we bring in a new EPR system, we bring in new clinical solutions and yet the, the whole process remains fundamentally the same. Well, that's what, so, so something that David Wallacher said at one of our events. So David Wallacher is currently the CIO at Royal Liverpool and Royal Green, um, going to, uh, uh, to Oxford um, University Hospitals um, as their Chief Digital and Partnerships Officer. Um, and one of the things that he said recently was it's around process. You know, if you've got a bad process and you digitize the process, all you've done is sped up the bad process. Um, and, and you might now have some flashy lights and shiny kit on it, 
but fundamentally it doesn't matter. It's still a bad process. Um, so you've got to get process right, change right, buy in and sure. tech that complements that. Sure. So how big in terms of scale um, is your operation to deliver these high value events? So we've, um, well, if I give you a bit of a backstory on it. So, so we've only been going for 18 months now or just over probably about 20 months. Um, uh, January 2018 and um, we started on my kitchen table me and one other and uh, and we'd done that until about the April time and then in April 2018 so last year um, we then moved into an office that is uh, probably no bigger than this room and for those obviously that can't see the size of this room it's not very big um, about what four by four <laughs> something like that yeah. um, we had uh, so we, we, we basically hired two people at that point um, and then we had that same team that, that, that delivered then our first event, which was in the June. And then we scaled up a little bit. I think we brought on maybe two more people um, uh, and then delivered two more events for the rest of that year. And then and then at the start of this year, we moved into uh, uh, our standalone office uh, across two floors. And um, and we've now scaled up to, there's 11 of us um, internally. Um, so, so yeah, so we've got a team of basically um, four on delegate acquisition, three sales, myself, a production, um, and then an operational and financial person. Um, and so everyone digs in. And so, you know, essentially the events are delivered by 11 people. Um, but obviously at different stages, you know, there's sure. a production person getting the speakers and so on, which I take ownership of, of some of the events. And, uh, one of my guys, Chester, uh, takes ownership of, of across the other public sector events that we do and then, um, and so on. So, so yeah, so it just, it, Depends on where we're at with that. I get I get the vibe when when I when I came in that this is a more um, family centric type of operation. Absolutely, yeah. yes. Would you like to allude to? to? <laughs> See, there we go. You didn't you didn't even know that either. Uh, so so um, so actually, so going back on 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 further on the story. So how we started. Um, so I actually went to my mum for some investment, and my mum is our FD. Um, so she owns um, uh, another business, and she does all of our invoicing, payroll. Um, supplier engagement in terms of paying them and, and so on and so forth. Um, a lot of the admin stuff as well. So thank you, mum, for doing that. And then uh, and my stepdad also involved in a lot of the content that we produce. He's a fantastic photographer as well. So he does all the photography at our events and um, it has an active role within the business a few days a week where he then takes the content that we've got. So we've released some podcasts and so on from um, from the audio that we've recorded at the events on the stage. And uh, and he's put that together. So we've released sure. that and then the pictures and, and videos that we put together and so on post events. So, so yes. Uh, so it is a family business. Uh, mum and stepdad are very much involved and, um, it's good. Yeah. It's good. And th th I could tell from the way you're speaking. So, so lovingly about your family. Did you feel that gives you some sort of competitive edge in terms of how you go about running your meetings, how you execute each event? Yeah, in, definitely. Um, people see that on the day because because we're present, all of us are at the event. We're not. We haven't got a big corporate banner, you know, barrier up against us or or, or or display displaying us. We are very true to ourselves at these events, um, and I think people are actually. I don't know how to say this without making myself sound like a twat. Um, uh, people are impressed um, um, by me at the event because I have such an active role within the event in terms of I get involved in everything. So I run the mics, I hold doors open for people, I welcome people, I register them, I help the sponsors to execute their meetings and so on and so forth. Um, and Jack and really does do that. I could, I could testify to that. Jack really does do that. There's not many MDs, um, senior people in companies that actually get involved in all the aspects in ensuring the delegates are well taken care of at events. So yeah, big up. Thank you very much. So, so yeah, so, so, so I am active in that and, and I think people kind of, it creates a better atmosphere and that's one thing that our events absolutely have is, is a cracking atmosphere um, because, you know, we, we, we don't walk around like drill major sergeant and cattle people round or, or have people around like cattle as there are so many events um, and people, people just buy into the atmosphere and, and, and can tell that, 
it is a family run business. Do you have a mantra? Is there like a company mantra that you guys all walk in, subscribe to, <laughs> or do a chant to before each event? Absolutely, yeah, we all sing. Uh, <laughs> uh, that, yeah, what, yeah, what, what is it? it? That's it. Um, I think it's uh, just about being ourselves. Um, I think that honesty there yeah integrity. honesty integrity um doing the right thing because it's the right thing um whether it's the wrong thing short term but the long thing right term um i think that's really important and there's things that i've done that probably are not the most sensible business decision to do but for the micro loss i've got a macro win um sure, sure. In- that's that's big can you see that's a mic drop i told you <laughs> jack is here to drop bombs all right so say that again please so I was saying about um, for the for the micro loss, there's a macro win, oh, and what and what I mean by that is 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 basically so there was so examples here. Um, I've had people come to me and just say, "Look, Jack, I've had our local government sales director leave the organisation." Um, and this was a, a company that were that had reference for us. So they'd spoken to companies that also wanted to sponsor and, and testified that our events were good to go to business wise. Should I have taken that revenue off the board and mm. said, I understand your pain? Probably not. Probably not the most sensible thing to do in the world in terms of actually take revenue off the board long term. Could I have got one more deal out of them? If I had said no, if I'd been a, quote unquote and ask about it yeah. um, or just not been human about it and and understood the situation which was a legitimate situation and don't get me wrong I'm not a walkover so if, if there's a situation that occurs that I have to put my down my foot down to and say no that's sorry that's that's not happening then I will but sure. but for a legitimate reason where it, it's actually they're wasting their money I would rather take it back to it and say look okay let's let's park the revenue on to next year um, so I've not fully taken it off the board Um but they remember that in the relationship. And now I'm going to land and expand. They're going to take a bigger passion. They're going to have two, two or three events next year. Whereas if I said, no, 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 you have to do it. It's so short term mindset. Yeah, and, yeah. And a lot of people, um, quite frankly, you're at your age, mm. 10 to age or 25. It's all about the now. The yeah. here and the now. Me, 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 me. Yeah. Um, my father um, taught me at a very young age to have what's called deferred gratification. Yep. You know, always postpone um, your profits for the future. Have you heard of the marshmallow the test? Yes, I have my, indeed. My did, daughter passed it, so there we did go. She? Oh she my did. god! Oh my god! The marshmallow test. Yes, all the information is going to be in the show notes. The marshmallow test was a test conducted, I think, in the seventies or eighties, where they got a group of young children. Yeah. Um, I think four or five four, year olds. Yeah, four yeah. or five year olds. To they were tempted with marshmallows, right? So basically, it was just. So they had a sweet next to them and said, if you, you can eat that now, or if you wait 15 yeah, minutes yeah. or wherever it was, then you can have two. And, um, and so, yeah, it was a case where she was Maisie out. My daughter was, was four at the time and we'd done the same thing to her and she passed and she it. she passed the marshmallow passed. test. Wow. I, I know I would not have passed that one myself. Neither would I. No, I wouldn't. But then this whole concept of deferred gratification, it comes from a, a wiser place. I think it's not something that you can just just do you know that you've got to have an element of confidence about you to know that okay fine i'm taking a hit now but the future's going to be rosy you know um where's that come from in terms of your own background you spoke about your daughter passing the marshmallow test yeah. and i'm sure you ate both marshmallows afterwards. <laughs> where did you, where does that come from in you i don't know really um i don't think i think in terms of my background so <laughs> I certainly wasn't brought up with a silver spoon in my mouth by any stretch of the imagination. Brought up um, council house um, until probably about the ages 11, 12. And then eventually my mum bought her uh, bought a house that we then moved into. Um, so, 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 so definitely not, um, wasn't brought up with a, with a kind of a privilege, privileged background. Thank you. I'm struggling for the word there. Um, I think that, I was always a bit of a naughty boy at school as well. So I I actually got kicked out of school in the end. So I was put on, instead of expelling me, they put me on um, extended study leave is what they called it. Extended study leave. Extended <laughs> study leave. Um, so, uh, so I've always been a bit of a rebel without a cause and just not really gone, not really done things by the book. Um, what do you see when you see a, a scenario yeah. play, playing out? Right? Yeah. Do you 
see the funny side of the situation? 100%. Do you see the irony in the situation? I'll probably see that as well. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, um, the negative side all at once? Definitely no negativity. Uh, no. Well, you know, a bit. I'm not that pessimistic, You're though. not that person. No. Your glass is always half full, yeah? My glass is full. You're good, good, good. So you wear, you air on the side of the abundance. Yes. Yeah, there's always other opportunities out there. Absolutely. But the fact that you do see irony and you do see the funny side of situations, that, that must have led to many interesting um, situations growing up, as you talked about being um, put on... Um, early it? study leave. Early study. Did. I was going to yeah. say gardening leave, but he was too young to go on gardening <laughs> Far too young to go on gardening leave. I'd enjoyed that. I got paid to sit on uh, sit yeah. there for, for four or five weeks. Exactly. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> give us some, some situations so, whereby... So I've been a sack from about seven jobs. Um, I, I almost feel like I was employable. Um, not in the sense that... I was a, I was a bad worker because I was never a bad worker. I always had a good work ethic and, and it, even from a young age had jobs. So um, I remember going around the local estate, um, knocking on doors with a bucket and sponge and so on and washing cars and, and literally just going door to door with neighbours, you know, three quid, four yeah. quid for a, a car washing time. And how long ago was that? Oh, that was real. Just, probably, just so people get the context. Oh, right? okay. Well, saying that, I didn't even think about it. Probably about 12, 13 years ago. 12, 13 uh, years ago. Yeah. I, I would still, still say 12, 13 years ago for a young kid to knock door to door with a bucket and a sponge offering to wash a car. That takes a lot of testicular fortitude. We call that. I don't know what that means. Yeah? <laughs> because, let's be honest, um, parents could just go to the local car wash. I think yeah. 10, 13 years ago, there was an influx of the five pound car washes. Yes. So well, actually, that was my first job. So at the age of then really? 14, 15, my first job then was in a car wash. And I used to do every Saturday and sometimes Sundays, eight till six yeah. washing cars. Yeah. Um, and I... I naturally progressed from door knocking to sure. to working in a car wash um, sure. made it big time so did you so <laughs> that experience knocking on the doors um, how did that feel I don't know see I people would say it was scary but I don't know maybe you're so naive to the situation of actually this is essentially cold selling face most to face most definitely and whether I I probably just didn't look at it in that way then I think I'd be probably more nervous about doing it now then, well, saying that, how weird would that be? 25 I'm knocking on the door for a three pound car. Um, um, but yeah, it, it wasn't a scary thing. It was just that we were so, I was so focused on, I wanted to get a car wash so I could get the money. Yeah, the focus, right? Yeah, absolutely. In terms of the, um, the out, outcome. Yeah, so, definitely. So you realise everything else is just part of the process. I think mm -hmm. it's too many times um, young people, even adults, we go through the same thing. We go through our trials and tribulations. We struggle here and there and we lose sight of what this is all about, our big why. Yes. And I guess your big why was that paycheck that you, you're aiming for. You know, I'm like Absolutely. a greyhound chases a white rabbit. You know, you know what you're after. So that will allow you to present yourself into any situation. So are you a fan of like setting goals? Massive fan of setting goals. Massive How do you go about setting your goals? So just, I think if you don't have a goal, where are you heading? You know, there's so many people out there that just are literally going through the motions. Um, what, what direction do you have in your life if you haven't got a goal that you're working towards? You know, there, there, there literally is nothing. You, you need to have a set down goal might drop money again, like, apparently. Well, most definitely. <laughs> most definitely. You need to sit down, go and I interrupted your flow there. Keep going. No problem. Um, you need goals without a doubt. and But but at the same time, you need long and short-term goals. So it's not just about saying, right, I want to be a millionaire or whatever it might be. Mm. Uh, I want to be a professional footballer. I want to be a singer. I want to be an actor and so on. You need to have a breakdown of how do you achieve that? Okay, 10 years. That's how we get to becoming, let's just say, an actor. Right. First of all, I need to join a drama club. Now I need to, first goal is let's, let's get our main part in a local play. Whatever it might be. And I'm just, just thinking out loud here in terms of an example. Um, people are so like, oh yeah, want to be successful. But then sit at home for three hours of an evening and play Xbox. Most definitely, most definitely, most definitely. I, I understand that concept very well. And um, 
you have to make sacrifices to to achieve your goals, right? Absolutely. And uh, I like the way that you broke down your goal into various steps mm. and also short term, long term um, goals because some some goals can be interchangeable and you have to be adaptable to that. But again, you know, without certain goals, you have no true north. And a lot of people, professionals and non professionals mm-hmm. in any any sector, are guilty of having that. Infliction, should I say, mm. not setting goals. So how granular are your goals? Are they really mapped down in terms of like this week I'm going to achieve X, Y, and Z? Yeah, so I think probably because I'm sad and I love work. Um, uh, a lot of my goals are career focused. Um, and uh, so, so on a macro level, I know where I want the company to be. Sure. Um, I know where I want it to be in a year, three years, five years, um, let's say. Um, but then at the same time, I know what the goals are weekly, monthly, quarterly, biannually and annually. Um, and so whether that be also as well, I think some things that are, our goals are just plans as well. And so, so, you know, you, you've to get to A to Z, you've got to go B, Z, Z, and so on. Um, and and so part of part of the things that are done perhaps aren't seen as goals, but are just seen as processes within the journey. Sure. Um, and I think that's important that you understand the difference between what might be perceived as a goal and what is just an element or a stage of achieving that goal. Sure, so again, so when you do achieve your goal, yep. do you have any way of marking that's like, how do you celebrate that you've achieved your goal? Probably something I need to get better actually, selling goals. See, I'm one of those people that I'm never happy, I'm never content, I'm always striving for the next thing. Mm. Um, so for example, um, we've now done a million pounds since we started turnover. Mm. And that's in what time frame again? <laughs> About 20 months. Um, <laughs> um, but that, do you know what that is though? You know, you see a million pound, but you don't see the blood, sweat and tears that have gone into that. You know, it's the long nights. I, for, for probably, probably the, it's not, I don't see my children for that long during the week. Um, and that's because at the moment I'm working to provide the life that, they deserve in my eyes sure, um, sure. and and they, the, the life that I also want absolutely and this is take, take sacrifice a lot of sacrifice so every day I do 12 hours I get into the office for half past seven and I'm very very rarely home before half past seven um, and that's Monday to Friday every week um, without fail I'm first in I'm last out Every single so, day. So do they see you um, putting in the sacrifice? And how, and how old are they? So I've got um, two daughters. Uh, one's six, one's two. Um, and so um, I see six-year-olds usually up before I get in. Um, sure. But, but uh, Nala, my two-year-old, um, is is usually asleep. Um, um, but then saying that, you know, she, my missus brings her into the office. So it's not like, you know, and she does that a couple of times a week. So um, it's not like she doesn't see her dad. Sure. Um, sure. But you know, but then it means that you know I'm not then out on on the beers on a Friday night or all day on the Saturday and so on because I've got two days left to spend with them and and I think it's real. We're in this generation now where I'd, uh, perhaps when you was younger, by 25, 30, everyone had moved out hey, of house. Don't get confused just because I'm grey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still younger at heart. <laughs> But, but, on, right, man. you know, yeah. at 25, 30, everyone had moved out of their family home, right? Yeah, the majority, in fact, uh, my generation was um, born in 74, so we were at the stage whereby some of us, because again, I didn't go, I didn't, um, I was not raised with a silver spoon in my mouth, it was more like a plastic one, to be honest. As soon as we reached that age of 18, we were thinking of excuses to leave home. Yeah. But in fact, we were like, literally, if we weren't looking for excuses, we were being kicked out anyway. Yeah. So either we were, we were down at the council, council offices saying, look, we've been kicked out, house us. Or for those of us who had the, um, Enterprise already working, already renting, yep. or at university, college, whatever the case would be. So, but we were actively, you're, you're right there, we were actively trying to get out. Yeah, absolutely. So, so the majority of my mates still live at home with their mum and dad. And that's fine because, you know, who am I to dictate what journey other people should be on? Most definitely. Um, 
but but that's not for me and and you know so i moved out of my family home at 18 and i've pretty much been renting since then um annoyingly actually i wanted to buy this year and uh gazumped not that it gets um so um well here we go here's the announcement <laughs> so so jordan who's my missus is is pregnant with our third oh so. well done oh go. well done <laughs> um it's the sun right uh well fingers you crossed but then i can't say that because this is recorded right isn't it it's so, recorded yeah son or daughter it doesn't matter of it course it does not matter oh, yeah. it's going to be a son <laughs> positive thinking positive thinking um so yeah, so the next uh, England World Cup winner, of course. Um, <laughs> uh, so I can't remember where I was going with that. Um, I'm going to ask you a question. Go on. In terms of, and it'll probably come back to you. Anyway. Yeah, we were talking about people living in. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Uh, oh, we buy, we're talking about me buying a house. Yes, and you had yep. an announcement. Well, yes, and, you, and you've done the done the mic drop. Yes, yes. And then, and so, 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 um, so she's so she's pregnant. And so, because I own my own business, I've got to have two years worth of accounts yeah. to, to then get the mortgage, um, which will be in oh, December 31st uh, this year. Um, and baby's due in April. Um, so she's just about 12 weeks now. Um, and, um, and so there's just not going to be enough time for me to then have the accounts Sure. Yeah, then and then and then sure. mortgage, more, or, you know, mortgaging principal and so on, and find a place before the baby's born. And the place that we're in at the minute is just too small. So uh, this is just a process thing for you. Process thing. So we've just actually agreed to rent a nice big four bedroom detached house. Wow. Um, uh, as of yesterday, actually, oh, so we reviewed it and then signed the paperwork yesterday. So we move in on the twenty fifth of October. Oh, excellent, so, excellent. Oh, we wish you good luck in that journey. Thank you, thank I was going to ask you in terms of this whole. The holy grail of work-life balance. You yes. know, talked about putting in a 12-hour week. Yeah. Me being a clinician, I can testify to that. I do that myself all the time. Um, but some people will say, oh, how do you do the, how do you get work-life balance? So what's your answer to that? I think that you've got to value the time that you've got and make most out of it. So I, you know, I think that I think actually my missus struggles with it a little bit. Um and 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 because I'm so yeah, we're we're at such an early stage of this business that it is consuming um, and and mentally consuming. So when I get home from work, work in my mind doesn't stop, um, and it's the thing that I think about mostly as I wake up, and the thing about thing that I think about mostly when I when I go to bed, um, plan out different scenarios, ideas, so on and so forth. So it's difficult for that work-life balance, but I think that you've just got to make the time count that it is there and it's around quality time. Um, um, and, and just, just kind of understanding that it's not going to be like this forever. Sure, um, and, sure. and, but this is ultimately part of the journey and, Most definitely. Uh, and, 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 you know, if you, at the end of the day, you know, the dreams that I've got are big. Um, and, and so working a six, eight hour day, just ain't gonna make it. Do you, do you share it. your dreams with your children? I know you got one is six, so she yeah, probably be able to understand some something. Yeah, so she so she's just turned six in August. So um so absolutely and I think actually so my missus and me, so so I actually I've actually went to primary school with Jordan as well. So so we've known each other for years. We kind of had a uh, a similar upgrade uh, in terms of council house and so on and so forth. Um, I think we're both striving to give our children, you know, without them turning into, you know, the silver <laughs> spoon people. Uh, that yeah. We, uh, yeah. we don't want them to be. Um, so, so yeah. So, so, but Maisie, I think she understands that, you know, it, nothing comes for free in this world and, and you've got to Most work definitely. for it. And, um, and that's one thing that, I'll be hot on is, is, is around work ethic and, and effort and trying and, and so on. And, you know, bless her. She does her club. So she, she does clubs like five days a week. So she does, like, she's busy. Yeah. Sunday and Monday are only days off. So she does dance, gymnastics, swimming, uh, and so on. So, uh, so she's active and she works hard for, for her shows and so on. So yeah. It's sure, good. So she probably gets that from you then, right? Both me and her mum, definitely. Oh, brilliant, definitely. brilliant. That's a politician's answer. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but no, on, on, a, on, a, on a more serious note, that we t- I work in camps, so I deal with children with um, mental health challenges, yeah. right? anxiety, depression, all of that kind of stuff. But one thing I can tell you from um, looking after these young people is they tend to do, children tend to do, what they what they see their parents doing, 
So if you just see dad and mom's always hard working, they're more likely to emulate that than what the parent actually tells them. Yeah. Like even me, if people t- if someone tells me to do something, I'm likely not going to, I'm probably not going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Just because I'm that um, resistive, you know, but if I see somebody doing something and I can observe the results are favorable, yeah. I'm more likely going to emulate that. So um, as your children grow, this is a compliment to yourself that they're seeing your your struggle. This is why um, when you see celebrities out there and, and they're traveling up and down the country with the children in tow, yeah. or if your dad's a footballer and then the child grows up playing football, to somebody that's not that observant, they might think, oh, it's just nepotism. Yeah. And not realizing that child has been immersed if you talk about David Beckham's children or any other um, footballers, um, any other child who's got a famous dad playing football, not realizing that that, that child was immersed in football from the birth. Yep. Yeah. So they've got every right to be in that environment. Well, I think I've got that from my mum because my so my mum so so she owns she actually owns the only female owned um, garage in the southeast. Um, there we do go. I, do I mom. name the garage? Uh, yeah, AMK Gatwick. Um, so there Brilliant. we go. Well done. Salute to mum. Indeed. So 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 it was it was my granddad's, um, um, and he so he went bankrupt and he. But, like any, so you get so many businesses like builders and, and 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 mechanics and so on, and what happens is a mechanic thinks they can then start you know running a business and it's no you're a mechanic, a mechanic yeah. and you're trying to run a business. So my granddad was the same as that and just tried to be dodgy and so on and so mm-hmm. forth, and he actually went bankrupt. So when they re, um, and this was donkeys ago, and and when and when she. Um, when they had to redo the accounts, they, they put them in my mum's name. My mum was probably 21, 22, so really naive to it. You know, that's fine, you know. So I didn't really have any involvement in the business. And then as she kind of got older and, and wiser and so on, she thought, oh, I'm, things go Pete Tong here. I'm in, I'm in trouble. Um, so then started working down and worked on reception and so on. Um, and then my granddad emigrated out to New Zealand um, when I was about 11. Um, and then my, so she, so my mum technically owned 50% of the business um, um, from where the accounts were in her name and, and so on. And so when he moved to New Zealand, um, uh, she then got a loan or whatever and bought his half of the business out. Um, and, and literally, you know, from her taking over and people are like, what, your mum owns a, a, a MOT and car repair garage. You know, what is she a mechanic? No, she's not a mechanic. She's a businesswoman. She, she's a businesswoman. And, and that's why it works. And that's why the business has gone from strength to strength because she's not a mechanic running a workshop. Sure. She's a businesswoman running a business. Yes. Um, and so, you know, for us, you know, our summer holidays were spent, down the, what we call the yard um, because we, so, you know, we, we didn't have anyone to look after us during the day or thingy. And so, you know, we were out when we was kids building bases and, you know, in the, in the, in the fields and woods around where, where they were and, and so on. And we kind of grew up. So I definitely saw, and you know, her hours have always been eight till six. And so it was a case where. And you yeah, saw that, right? Absolutely. We yeah. saw that. And it yeah. was cut to a case in, you know, when we was then old enough to, to fend for ourselves. Um, 11, 12, 13, that, you know, obviously we didn't need to go to the garage to, to, sure. um, to, to, um, to do that. So yeah, I've, I saw that then from a young age that you know, she put in the effort and she put in the hours and, and so it's then, so it's then it's not, it's kind of second nature now because I've seen it growing up. Sure. So just, I'm just in terms of what you said there and, yeah. and, and saying, you know, do what, uh, show, show me and, and I'll do it. Yeah. Um, and, and so, yeah, I definitely resonate. No, with that. that's brilliant. So, so again, you've got the, the, the immersification with your mother in around business, mm. you know, um, taking things in, um, do you actually, um, supplement that with reading any particular books? Yeah, around def- business. Yeah, definitely. So, um, sales books. Um, so, so I've always been, um, fascinated by sales uh, and and you know to the point where I, I anyone that says I'm bad at sales well so was I once it, but it's because I bothered to learn because I watch sure. YouTube videos and read books there and and so on you know you, you everyone's rubbish at everything they first start doing sure and it's about you taking the ball by the horns and 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 putting the effort in to become a master of your craft. And, and that just takes effort outside of doing the job, but also 
learning and listening from experts in the industry. Sure. Um, and so, yeah, so, um, and then also as well, um, you know, listen to a lot of podcasts um, like Gary V and um, Tom Bill yes. and um, Grant Cardone more on the, on the sales front and um, audio books and, and so on. And I think it's just, I find it, I, for me, I wouldn't read a, a, a fiction book because I think it's a waste of time. Yeah. I, if I'm reading, I'd read a nonfiction, like a, a self-improvement type book. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's not really a rare thing. Most, no. most high performing individuals don't read fiction because of exactly what you said. Um, they're reading things pertaining to personal development or things associated with something they need to learn mm. opposed to the fiction mm. type, type of stuff. You know, um, certainly I wouldn't binge watch something that was has no real value in terms of moving me to where I want to get to in my life. So, Definitely. no, I salute you in that one. So how are you finding the old, uh, audio books? Do you find, do you listen to them in the car um, when you're at work and your headphones on? What's your yeah. process? So I've got a dog, so walking the dog, definitely. Yeah. Um, we've started a process um, each morning of, um, of listening to a sales book as a team. Um, really? So we listen to 20, 30 minutes a morning. Um, just gets everyone in the right mindset for the day. Sure. Um, gets everyone kind of but also not not just in the right mindset but also kind of it's it's the right thing to listen to when you're starting to then sell yes because you can then put in practice what you've learned for half an hour in that morning during the day as well as what you've learned yesterday and the day before and so on um so a mixture a mixture um and uh and just bought uh, an amazon um for home as well so i have one in the office and, and for home as well so um yeah so i won't have to be um headphoned in sure. to stuff. so when you when we're talking about sales um and obviously you, you must train your your new candidates yeah um what the, what, what are your, the biggest challenges you observed in the way they go about selling i think people try and put on a facade and and, and try and not act themselves and i think why one reason that i've been so successful is I don't really change for anyone and, and especially to deal with the, the level that we need to deal with um, on perhaps on, on, on the client side, the NHS side or the local gov side or, and so on. These people, these CIOs, these chief executives are, are so used to people, for want of a better phrase, kissing their ass yes. because and it's just that same corporate lingo they hear time and time and time again. And I think it's a, perhaps they find it refreshing when you get someone that's just themselves yes. um, and I don't mind about calling people mate I know there's things that people say oh don't call people mate you don't I can't help it you know that's the way I speak I, sure. I wouldn't be authentic if I thought something and, and didn't and things like I swear a lot not I try and turn it down when I'm on the phone but you're doing quite well by yeah now. I am I am I said the T word <laughs> earlier and I thought oh, should I said that um, uh, so uh, yeah no I, 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 I'm, I've been biting my tongue a few times um, but I think in swear words sure and so that's what comes out of my mouth sure. um, sometimes you've got to be brutal right yeah absolutely absolutely yeah. so so I think that the, going back to the question about what do people struggle with I think that people try and put on this cor this corporate lingo that everyone's already pre-set to you know they've heard that before yeah. and, and, and subconsciously on autopilot that's what gets dismissed sure um, and I'm not afraid to I think a lot of other people as well they cling on to stuff and they'll cling on to stuff because of the, the fear of, of losing that deal or whatever yeah. if people think you asking a question to someone to buy for a commitment is going to cost them the deal then you're you're deluded yeah. you asking the question is not going to cost you anything um, it's either going to get you the deal and if, if you don't, if you think someone hasn't bought on the basis that you've asked them to buy they was never ever going to buy correct um, we call that assuming the ostrich position <laughs> you know I've seen it in sales um, prior to this um, going on air me and Jack were just talking about sales and I think Jack, Jack was talking about we're all in sales now mm. You know, Everyone's a sales. You know, even to get Jack on this podcast, I had to sell it to Jack. <laughs> if I couldn't sell it to Jack, Jack wouldn't be here sharing his vocals on the airways right now. I can tell you he's a busy guy. So I'm very, very blessed for that. But yeah, sales is one of those things that is complicated. And um, being authentic, mm. as Jack said, is one of the, because I see it from the clinician side of things, mm. even though I'm in sales, but I'm not in sales kind of. Um, Sometimes people are scared of being their true selves. Mm. Maybe because they haven't... Or being over polite. So have you seen the yeah. emails? 
and I call it weak language. Yeah, and it's just fluffy like, talk. Fluffy, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's just, just get to the point. Yeah. Senior people, if you look at the way they email, they don't email paragraphs. No. They are short, sweet, to the point. That is how they're responsive as well. And that's what they respond to. If they see an email that is so long, so polite, so... It's like, a, it's like a psalm from the Bible. It's yeah. like a biblical entry. You know, <laughs> I look at those things. I, I, my, my inbox is flooded with those. Yeah. And to be honest, I read probably three or four lines. Yeah. And I don't even read each line. It goes in the B1N, as I call yeah, it. Yeah, I, I don't signing. know what. I just... The bin. I would probably read every third letter, every yeah. third um, word, because I, I just don't have the time. Yeah. You know, um, what do you want me to do? Yeah. You know? Um, and when do you want me to do it? And yeah. And then, do it's, yeah. That, exactly. Exactly. Because I think people generally um, identifying people's needs. Yeah. Um, it's all about uh, sales is around questions. Yeah. Sales is questions. That's all it is. And and the best person in history, um, in terms of like modern type history, is Socrates. In terms of Socrates, the um, ancient Greek philosopher, he would never answer a question directly. You always answer a question with a question. And sounds like a politician. Yeah, yeah. But then <laughs> he, then he came up with this it came up with this thing like they call it like Socratic questioning. Yeah. So that you ask the right questions that will lead you to will lead the other person to the answer that they're looking for. Right. Get it. You see what I mean? So yeah. so you're in control all the time mm. through exactly what you're saying, the questioning. You're just asking the right leading Close sometimes, open sometimes. Mm. So literally, they're they're being steered along to making a decision yeah. that you can do something with. Yeah, you know. So absolutely. So yeah. So and it's also coming to the, coming to terms with the fact that not not everyone's going to buy. Yeah, you've got to understand that that you haven't done anything wrong. It's just a person wasn't ready or wasn't it, the, the need wasn't there, and that's okay. And you've got to. And I say this to people as well at our events. One of one of the benefits from coming to our events as a as a solution provider, as a tech firm or a consultancy or whatever that wants to sell to our public sector clients, one of our major value propositions is we accelerate their nose. So you you they'll get to meet say fifteen C and director people um, 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 on a one to one basis at our events, um, contractually guaranteed. Um, part of that value proposition is the fact that. You, you then haven't got to spend a day going around to see each yeah. one to still get that same answer that you're going to get your no. So not only are you accelerating your yeses, but you're also wasting less time because you're going to get your no's quicker as well. Yeah. And, and, and and that's just part and parcel of it too. And that's, that's, that's brilliant because again, we waste a lot of time um, in software companies, mm. you know, trying to pitch and sometimes pitch to the wrong audience. Mm. I think it's similar to... Um, musicians, artists who go for auditions. Um, if you had a solution for them to accelerate their nose, because they know um, the more nose they get, they're getting closer to the one year yes. that could be the big break and in going into the world and smashing it, you know? So again, it's a similar process. Give me the nose now. Yep. Let me learn from the feedback. Yep. Then I'll come back again. Yep. So that, that, that tees up quite nicely to your background, you're a bit of a dark horse yes. in terms of your talents. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> you, go that far, yeah, yeah, yes, you can sell. <laughs> um, before, I'll tee up rather slowly so, you, so it starts to warm up, really. <laughs> um, in terms of selling, there, there, there are different platforms that selling now is taking place on the, on, on media. Yep. You know, from even, not WhatsApp, you've got Instagram, you've got, say, Facebook, mm. LinkedIn, Snapchat, all that kind of stuff. So, and each one of these platforms requires a different type of your personality to engage yep. on. So which, um, which platform do you think is working for you in terms of reaching out and getting more revenue? Yeah. Oh, without a doubt, LinkedIn. LinkedIn is, is, is my go-to platform. Um, I've got Instagram, but I don't really use it, which is probably a bit weird for my age, isn't it? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just sorry, yeah. So LinkedIn is definitely, yeah, yeah. Um, LinkedIn is definitely my, my go-to platform. Um, you know, you get the, the, the stats on your iPhone now 
and it says like, what have you spent the most time yeah. on? Mine's LinkedIn, not Facebook, not Instagram, not so on. Yeah, mine's LinkedIn. Um, so yeah, without a doubt, LinkedIn. Okay. Now, now back to where we are. <laughs> I know where you're going. <laughs> um, you posted something rather interesting and you talked about being authentic. Yeah. And this ties in with the fact that you spend a lot of time on LinkedIn. Yes. And a lot of people on LinkedIn, I see, let's be honest, on that platform, it's more to do with professionals, graduates, people in key key um, positions within companies. Yep. They gravitate to LinkedIn, right? And typically they, they post the same type of stuff. It's the people that post a video. I'm going to post, I'm going to post a quick video today. Yeah, exactly. Why don't you all start with that? <laughs> and do you know what? If I, if I see... You know what I really find annoying? Yeah. Is at a sales event or like a health expo, whatever type of event it is, you see people posting a picture of them standing behind a stand. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Or mid-flow talking to somebody, right? When the reality of the situation doesn't go like that half the time. No. You know, I think um, we have a lot, a long way to go in terms of selling. And I'm old school when it comes to selling. Yeah. I'm like market school selling. You know, apples, pears, blah, blah, blah. I could get your attention. I done a boot, I done a boot sale last year. Yeah. Honestly, if I could do a boot sale every weekend, that is my idea of fun. Yeah. It was amazing. Yeah. And we've done about 300 quid at a boot sale. See, there you go. It there was, you go. it was. There you go. It was like that. That fun. is to me is selling that engagement. Yeah, I mean, you can put, say, put it in their hand, they go buy it. As soon as you, as soon as you get them to touch it, that's it. Touch you, it. You're ninety percent there. Own it. You Absolutely. know. So yeah. So <laughs> yeah. that that's the school where we're from, whereby we talk about direct selling. And too many times you go to these health events and you see people on stands and they're struggling to sell. But well, if you're struggling to, to get people to engage with them, because I, they're behind it, they go behind the table, which is like. Yeah. Why are you? Why have you got something in front of you, blocking someone yeah. from coming into your space? Exactly. Exactly. So when when I when I for company I work for when we do these events, we rarely rarely ever are behind. We're out there. We're mingling. We're in the crowd. We're we're conversating, and we're actually interesting people. I, I would say to anybody that wants to get into sales, um, you have to first and foremost like people. If you don't like people, you can't get into sales. This is no way. If you're not interested, you gotta be like Colombo. <laughs> another question, please. Go you on. know, you gotta have another question. Another Absolutely. question. Another question. So on your LinkedIn, yep. being personal, yep. Um, you posted um uh, a, a, a post whereby you, you you talked about your experience being on X Factor. I did. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And that to me, that was fundamental. It was a highlight of my day. I, I, I too live on LinkedIn and I, I read the same stuff that I found something more refreshing yeah. to engage with. Yeah. And I think the more parallels we can draw from real experiences yeah. and then translate that to whatever sector that we're in as yeah. a professional, that's what counts. A post, the only posting things are so niche. Yep. It's every, everything's too corporate facade again, you know, and yep. um, it's so, it's just the same stuff you see time and time and time again on LinkedIn. Um, and, and so, so yeah, I'll, t- I'll tell you about that. So, so I posted about, um, so when I was 19, I done the, done the X Factor. Um, I think that in itself, this <laughs> is have something like the drop. Because um, that takes some balls. Well, it, yeah, though, though, I obviously didn't have anything because I absolutely cacked my pants and it was just, really? oh yeah, big time. So, so what happens is, so with the X Factor, um, I don't know if people know this or not, but there is a ton of producer rounds before. So you go for about four or five producer rounds before you even see the judges. So there's like one, maybe back in like March time. And I think the, sh- the show airs what, end of August, September time yeah, usually. Yeah. Um, Lead um, up to Christmas because they always have. Yeah. Their- and so that's when the first produce rounds and you go through round after round, it just whittles down, whittles down. And so I was, it was 2013. This is when they used to do the two auditions. So they used to do one in the room with the four judges. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, and then one on the main stage in front of a massive crowd of people, like 6,000 people at Wembley Arena. And then from there, then you get into to, um, boot camp. Um, before previous years, they've done like one in the room boot camp or one on the stage boot camp. And so this was the year they've done two. So in the in the room audition, I got through. I got four yeses. Um, and, uh, well done. Thank you very well much. Well done. Um, and so, so I was really 
common, but uh, do you know what? It was. What were you doing? Were you singing? Yes, yeah, singing. Yeah, X Factor yeah. singing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm sing- rapping, you know. Oh, of course, indeed. Yeah, yeah. I weren't dancing, <laughs> but I can assure you. Um, uh, but yeah, no, I was singing. So um, I I got through. So I sang Wonderwall, and um, it's a big song. <laughs> indeed. Indeed, um, and and got through um, that round, and then about three it's about three weeks later. Um, I then got on. It was my audition in front of six thousand people at, at Wembley Arena, in front of the judges. It, it was scary. Which judges did you have? So I had um, I had Nicole Scherzinger, Louis Walsh. Um, Louis was there at that time. Yeah, Louis. Okay, yeah. Louis, yeah, Sharon, uh, Nicole Scherzinger, and, okay. and Gary Barlow. Oh, Gary Barlow. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so I had those four, and um, and uh, so yeah. So, so I got through the the route, and, and then from that, I then I hadn't really like to, to be honest. I'm I can sing, but I'm not that good. Like. Um, I, uh, I, I'm not singing today either, before you ask. No. Uh, <laughs> um, <It's> still time. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I then um, went and then like engaged with a, a singing coach and so on and so forth and, and, and really kind of then like worked hard for those like three weeks beforehand. Um, but I didn't plan for the, in my head. And so I, I then was going to sing Crazy Little Thing Called Love. It's a Queen song, but it was a Michael, Michael Bublé version of it. Um <clears throat> And so I, I was singing it probably the best I was ever singing it. And, and in my head, I was going through it. Was, I was singing really, really well. Um, and I then got onto the stage. And what had happened is, so they do it in two sessions. They do a morning session and an afternoon session. There's like, say like there's 20 in each session. And they'd got around and he's making it. Everyone's thinking, yeah, he's making excuses now. Um, uh, <laughs> um, it, uh, so they'd only seen about 13 people. And I was meant to be in the morning session. They'd only seen about 13 people in the morning session. So they had to make up the, the sure, shortfall. Sure. Um, and I was first up in the afternoon session. Um, and so when I got out there, they, I started the song and it was, I was 19. It was, I was, it was very, very nerve wracking. Um, and they cut me really short, like 10 seconds into to, um, the song. They, they cut me off. Um, and then they said, I'll oh, sing another song. And, and, I really like stupidly I'd, I'd only really got one song nailed um, and so then I sung um, what was the song um, I can't remember that's how that's how that's how distant this memory is now that I wanted to be anyway um, and, and so anyway I sung terribly basically because I uh, by that point you know I'd been stopped I was in a proper bag of nerves and just couldn't couldn't get back to it sure um and so, so the post then that I post on LinkedIn, it was so, so it was a Sunday that it was in, it was like six years on and, um, and I had the, you know, on Facebook, you get the, on this day, yes, this yeah. like the memory things come yeah. up. Um, it popped back up. It was a, a, a picture that my mum had taken of me on TV. And so they showed me like a, maybe a 40 second clip of the audition. And it was like, they didn't show me getting through, obviously. <laughs> they just showed me mucking up. Um, and, uh, and so it was a picture of that. And so this was, so I thought, mm, it, it was something I wanted to put on LinkedIn, but I was still really embarrassed about it. And, it's, and, and if you search hard enough, and, and, and I urge people not to do this, obviously, you can find it on YouTube and it's awful. Um, and and so I've been really embarrassed about it ever since. And it's just like, people love to take the, take the mic, yeah. you know. Any, it's like yeah, an man. English thing, isn't it? Yeah. And anyone fails and they just, everyone jumps sure. on it. It's like, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah. You're one of us. Yeah, you're miserable <laughs> just like us. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I then put a post about, you know, six years ago on, on this Sunday that this this program aired and I've been I'm in an and and about putting this post out on LinkedIn and, um, and but, but you know, it's part of my journey and it's something that, that I've learned from definitely. Um and it's almost like, um, and so the, so the post said uh, along the lines of that, um, I was basically going for a quick win. I didn't want to be a singer. You know, if I wanted to be a singer, I'd have gigged for ages. I'd been passionate. I probably, I would have probably played an instrument. Um, I would have not just had singing lessons for three weeks between getting the four yeses in the room and going on the stage. I'd really not made any sacrifice. And that's what the post is about. The fact that, you know, I thought that, that at that point, that that's it. I was done for. Sure. You know, in my head. So so I was one. Of, you know, when you're younger and you think you're going to be famous. Yeah. Yeah. I had that until I was about 19. Like convinced. Yeah. There was there was, and I still dream. 
Yeah, like I'm going to be famous. <laughs> there we go. And I don't even know <laughs> in what <laughs> capacity. <laughs> uh, all I know is I should be famous. There we it's go. Well, a weird thing, right? Hopefully, this podcast pops, eh? Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> you know. So yeah. So 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 I so I I basically um, put a post about saying that you know that, that of course I was destined to fail. You know, I hadn't sacrificed. I hadn't put put any work yeah. in. I hadn't. Um, uh, I hadn't planned for the fact that if I had frozen and what the plan B was and all these different variables that ultimately what add up to then being successful in whatever capacity. Um, and, and it was a case where I was literally going for the quick win. Um, and, and, and thought that this was the easy option and this was, this was the option that was going to work for me. And, and so it was a real bit, a bit of a reality check. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, so I posted that on LinkedIn um, and about the sewing and how I've learned from that and I've now applied that to my business. And ultimately kind of that's what's not the driver, because it's definitely, you know, there's lots of things that are the driver, but definitely one of the the, the back benches of, of what's kind of pushed me on to, to, to not accept um, everything that, 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 that comes that, that's, that's normal. And, you know, I want to live this, this life that, not an abnormal life, but, but you know, have have great make life boom right exactly and now and now the thing in my head that that i i have absolutely no doubt in my mind that i will be successful there's there's you know i'm on the journey as as how you define it as as how you know and and how is success defined you know that that is you know you're successful i'm happy i've got two kids i'm married blah 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 blah. um i'm not married she's my fiance but i'm just saying as an example um that's that's success, you know, for well, someone that wants and you have that. Health. Have health, have well being, have happiness, you know, good mental state and so on. But but for me, you know, success is I've, I've owned, I own a successful business or businesses. I have um wealth, well being, happiness, I can work the hours that I want to work and it doesn't affect me financially and so on. And and so so I'm now on that that journey, and and I think that that the X factor for me was definitely a, a reality check um, to achieve that. Do you know what gravitated me to that article? Go on. Um, was the fact that you put it out there? That's one thing I've already talked about that. But the fact I was looking at it from a point of view that what would have been going through your mind, you know, to sing before 6,000 people, mm. you know, in terms of, and I know people like public speaking is one of the biggest fears. I think the top three biggest fears for all mankind. Yep. You know, public speaking is one of them, let alone singing in an audition <laughs> with the likes of Simon Cow, you know, who's notorious for saying no anyway, yep. okay. you know, to do that, you know, what sort of, forget the outcome, mm. you know, how did you prepare yourself psychologically Emotionally, what was your body going through? What, I don't what, think what I was the self talk? Did you have any self talk? I, 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 but I, do you know what? I was so convinced that I would get through on my singing that that and that's that's one of the pitfalls, I think. And that's what ultimately was, was a key lesson is that I didn't prepare properly in my head that I could get a no or that it wasn't gonna that it wasn't gonna work or or that I might freeze or I might get really nervous and, and just not be able to sing. Um and so I think that that was probably the downfall is that I didn't prepare for that situation. Um and I and I didn't didn't ment I wasn't mentally ready for it. And and that maybe is down to age, but then you look at other people, you know, that say, I don't know, Stacey Solomon. Yeah. I only found this out last night. She's she's only just thirty. I thought she was about that when she auditioned for the X Factor. Um, she was 19 when she auditioned for the X Factor. She smashed it. Other people that are younger than that smash it. Um, sure. It wasn't meant to be, sure. clearly. And I think, and I'm, I'm a great believer in everything happens for a reason and, um, and, and kind of... And there were timings there as timings, well. The timings exactly. there... As- if I didn't do that, then would I, my journey would be different, right? Yeah, and it, it's exactly. So this is how you take an experience that you might have perceived as negative, right? Yeah. And turn it into something that's positive. A lot of us, we take, we take rejection mm. and we take it too personal. Mm. You know, um, did you go through a period of time whereby you felt somewhat low after you got- 100%. It? Yeah. And again, so now let's talk through, well, I, what is your self-talk? How did you sure. get yourself out of that place? I think that I've always, um, I've always had a b- b- belief in myself. Um, and I talked earlier about me uh, kind of, um, 
getting kicked out of school yeah. and so on and so forth. Yeah. I don't, I, so, so actually off the back of that LinkedIn post, I had someone that was in my year at school, like, you know, I can't believe you are where you're at now. And I'm thinking, I'm not really at anywhere. I'm just doing what's right by me. Sure. Um, and so in my head, when people say, you know, you, you, you're doing really well, I'm thinking, this has only just started. I'm not doing well yet. This is, this yeah. is, this is the start of the journey. You wait until you see 10 years then you'll say, yeah, you're yeah. doing well. Um, yeah. and, I, and I think that it's that, that constant want for improvement, but also not being happy with the current situation, um, sure. and, and where you're at or never being content. I think it's probably a better word. Right. So, so to pick myself back up from that, I definitely was low after, but I didn't dwell on it for too long. It was more, the thing that's more embarrassing. So I didn't want to say this because it is proper cringy. So when I was on is stage, cheesy? not cheesy. So I basically said on stage and they put it on TV, I've crumbled. Yeah. So they so, so they okay. said like, you know, I said, I've crumbled. And you're probably thinking that's not as bad. The amount of abuse that I got for saying I've crumbled, <laughs> you apple crumbler. This was like from like friends, family yeah, as well. Sure. You know, like, like I say, people love to take the mick, don't they? Sure, and, yeah. and and especially in this, like people are really sarcastic, aren't they? In the in the south, um, and so uh, so it was I more. I can the, imagine the jokes. Oh, yeah. I can imagine it was it was jokes. you little crumbler. Yeah, you ruined your you know, just, just like harsh banter, but yeah. what you'd expect from your mate. You know what sure. I mean? Um, and so it was more that as the embarrassment that I said I've crumbled because that was what everyone held on to. Yeah. They would have picked up on something. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. You know, but obviously you, you gave it to one to play with the crumbled oh, one. Yeah. And so, uh, so yeah, so it was that, but it, I think then, and then I think from there, that's when I realised that I'm not going to be famous, like uh, for, for singing or for, for, for that, that kind of um performing arts, whatever it would be. Yeah. Sure. Um, and that's then when I really started focusing on my career. Um, and, um, and, and, and though before that, so I, I left school at 16, um, three months, four months before everyone else did, um, had to go and back and do my exams in a room on my own. So they didn't even let me in the exam hall. Um, and then GCSEs was, I've literally got like three GCSEs. So I've got maths, English, and a B. So I've got a C in maths, C in English, a B in PE. I was never stupid ever. Sure. Um, just didn't apply myself. School weren't, some people are just academics and I'm definitely not an academic. Um, and so, so then I went into, so I, I then, my blood, my brother's a plasterer. And so I went and worked for him for about six, seven months. And then for, I guess this ain't for me. I have asthma as well. And so it was causing my asthma. And, I, and, and actually, when I was younger, I spent a lot of time in hospital between the age of two and seven, eight, nine. Um, um, so much so I had a, so the, so the local hospital was Crawley Hospital and I had a, and the, the children's ward was Jumbo Ward and I just had a card basically. I didn't even have to go through A&E. Like a VIP card. Basically. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I could just, li- no, I was that, I was that ill, that Ill constantly, yeah. um, you know, ill, literally in hospital over Christmas a couple of times and so on and so forth. Um, and so, and thank, you know, touch wood, um, it's, um, it's manageable now. You know, I've sure. taken an inhaler once in the evening, once in the morning and literally don't really get an issue. Um, and so, so I then, so the, so the plastering didn't really help that. It was causing me to get ill and so on. So I, I had to keep that, not that head, but everyone else said, you know, you got the gift of the gab, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so I then, my first job in sales was I worked for a, and I'm sure it was dodgy. Um, I worked for a land brokerage and um, literally selling plots of land and not, not for like, I don't know if it's like, is it brown belt land? Brown belt, green or belt, green belt or green whatever, belt. green belt land. Mm. And so it was like this and it was like the potential that it might turn is brownfield land where you can then develop on it I, or whatever way around it is. Yeah. It was, it wasn't that yet, but it could, could be in yeah. 10 years. You're saying the potential. Yeah, exactly. And, and so it was commission only. Um, it was um, calling, I think the database was like people that had stocks and shares and, and, and shares and companies and so on. So and these it, were these soft leads, right? Not really. It was more like these people had invested in companies like Shell and BT okay. and Rada Rada. So they, they were people that you would assume invest in stuff, right? Mm. Um, and so it was commission only. And yeah, I'm 99% sure it's dodgy. I didn't, I was only there for about a month, um, but it was a really good 
ground into my sales career. I then went to a company called Niagara Healthcare who do like vibrating beds and chairs for people that have got arthritis and it just simulates blood flow. And it was basically, I was, a, I was an appointment setter for then the sales guy to go around to these typically old people's houses um, to then demo their equipment, their equipment and, and show them the art of the possible and so on. And I was bloody good at it. Um, and, and to the point where like within like eight months, uh, eight weeks, like, I was leading the sales board uh, wow. in terms of like appointment set. I was leading the point of the sales board for, I was like the third best in the call center, but the first best male. And, and like, there was like a lady called Karen and she was unbelievable. South African lady, remember? Um, you weren't beating her. She knew what to say. Yeah. She was empathetic and it, she was perfect. She had a soft voice and so on. No one was taking Karen down. Um, but I got to about third on the sales board. And I actually got sacked from that. And I got sacked from that job twice. So I think the first- How do you get sacked twice from the same job? Right, so so first time I kept calling my mates off the, that I would like, cause she was like done on call time. I okay. kept calling my mates. Um, okay. <laughs> just have chats with my mates and then they noticed that I was calling the same numbers and they checked the calls and all the calls recorded so they sacked me I then went to a, a dental supply company really first B2B sales role um, and um, and again done really well um, but the pay was rubbish um, and um, and the commute was I, I, I was 17 then I didn't drive at that point mm. like, you know, so I had to get the train and bike and it was, yeah, it was just a pain um so after about seven eight months of that i then left and that and then went back to niagara and they took me back um i got sacked again within about three four months so part of the, the pitch was that um you'd you'd filled out a survey that indicated that you had back pain and arthritis or whatever it was and the guy said that doesn't ring a bell so i went straight back and went ding 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 now does it <laughs> And, li- and and so they used to have like live listeners that used to monitor the call and I was just unlucky and this guy was listening to the call oh, as wow. I said it um, and so then I left there and then I went into recruitment for a bit I'd done recruitment for about three years or four years uh, um, for a few companies and I got so I got sacked from the first two I was rubbish at recruitment like recruiters if you are a good recruiter Hats off to you. You work like a slave. They, they, honestly, they are. They, they, they're graft. They, they're graft. They work long hours. Mm. They work hard. And and to be honest as well, it, it it's a thankless task. Anyone that you pitch as a client, they hate you. They're like, you're a recruiter. No, go up, you know. And I just I won't cut out for recruitment. Um, and then, um, and so I got sat from a future just because I was rubbish. Um, and then I got into event selling. And that's then when my career in sales really took off. And and I just hit the ground running with it within like, I think I'd done my first deal within like a week, two weeks of, of joining. And it just was went on and on and on over there. And then within two years, it was like half a million pound biller, top of the sales board. You know, this was like now by like the age of probably about 22, earning six figures at that age. And, and so this is only like three years ago. Three four years ago, wow. so I've only so 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 this probably might shock a few people that know me as well. Is that I've only been in the events game for about four years, and I just got it. I just yeah. get it. Yeah, um, you found your niche and uh, you ran with it. Absolutely. Um, and so I I basically um, I then got into so then I worked for a, for a, a company I'm not going to name because they're my now my competitor um, and um, and and. And basically just felt that they'd been going since about 2008, 2009 and their event model hadn't changed in that time. And I just felt there was change that needs to be made. The way that it was run was very military style, you know, like bells, whistles and people heard around like cattle and so on. Don't get me wrong, good events. Um, but I feel like the delivery could be a bit softer. Sure. And so I felt that I could then um, go and do it, do it myself and better. So I initially left them um, and I was going to start a company with with another girl who left at the same time, who was doing like the, doing the delegate acquisition um, um, uh, team. That then didn't pan out, and by that point, I had enough money to like put a deposit down for a house. And it was I needed to basically move into the house while so renting the house while I was still employed by them. And me and her were like, "Yeah, we're going to start this in January." So I moved in like the sixteenth of December into this like house, um, and. Uh, then I was going to put the rest of the money into the company. And um, so 
by that point, and then it come around to January, and she like bailed at me, and it was fine. Like again, everything happens for a reason. Yeah. So glad it happened because I definitely weren't ready at that point to to go and do it. And this was again three years ago. Okay. Um, um, so I've been in the for about five years. Um, and then I joined another. So then I so then I joined a company in um, um, in London, and I just hated the commute. Um, I've got this thing about commutes, haven't I? Um, and I didn't I didn't basically get along there for, um, um, for, 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 I, I was there for about probably about a, uh, about two weeks. Um, and it was a case where I, uh, I hated the commute and they were a great company. And so I ended up going back to the original company. Um, and so it was a case where I was there again for about, about six weeks. And this is when, so this was, uh, around the time that my daughter was born as well. Um, Nala, um, um, who's, come up free in um uh, in uh, february and so i went back and i, I smashed that done about 120 grand like for the business um sales wise in about six weeks and like pre the previous year i'd done like just shy of half so of now it. you're accelerating now yeah yeah yeah, massively, massively accelerating, um, you know, the deal. And I had a disagreement with the boss who then the next day, like in hindsight, I would have sacked me too. Um, because you know, that thing about like, whether you're, I think that Gary Vee says about like sacking your best person because of the, because of culture, like I would have sat me too, because I was too, I was being, I was, I was too, um, too smart, too, not too smart in the sense that I was clever, um, too smart in the sense that I, um, thought I was, whether actually I knew I was right. And that's not the point. Um, <laughs> it was a case where I couldn't be right because he was the boss. Right. Um, and, and it, I needed to be, I, I couldn't be the right person in that situation. And so, so anyway, so, so, so you two couldn't co coexist. Or no, we, we couldn't. And, um, and he then, so the next day he then come back and said, oh, I failed your probation. Um, and I was like, okay, well I get my commission. And he's like, no. I was like, well, I've just had a, my daughter's been born. Like, like, come on, like, yeah, where's the empathy? Yeah, you know, like, if you're going to get rid of me, I'm not leaving. Like, at least, and and he and he didn't. So whatever, you know, and and you know, that's by the by. It doesn't matter. Um, um, and so then I joined. He had a, a guy that had left him previously and started his own thing. Mm. Um, and so I then was like, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna join him. And I'm gonna build this company up and and so on. And um, and so I then joined that company like literally within like two three weeks. And and they were based. So the guy that was based up in Leeds he had someone work up in Leeds, and I was then based down in in, in Crawley. Um, and so I went from an environment where I was like in an office like with 20 people to then working at home on my own and I hated it. So, you know, so now I can do working at home and like, if I really have like a lot of stuff to do, like I'll sometimes work from home just so I've got no distractions, no, you know, from anyone in the office. Um, but when it's then every day and it's just like, especially cause I'm such a sociable person and, sure. and I, I need that kind of interaction, interaction and vibe and, and um, I think that's, that's quite important in a sales environment anyways, that is around the vibe and the energy that the group and success breeds success and so on. Um, and so I joined him for about six months and, and I think his business only had turned over about 30, 35 grand and they'd been going for like two years. I don't know how we, how we'd got to that point. Um, and I then, I think we grew the business to about 140 that year. And so they had an event in the November and Oh, it wasn't good. It really wasn't good. And, and like with the previous company, I'd the events had all, you know, we'd always walked away and gone like, yeah, that was a good event. Um, regardless of like whether they treat people poorly in my opinion or not. Um, and I didn't think that I, I, I walked away embarrassed, but the guy, the guy like hid. So like, it was so like, say it was like meant to be a hundred people turned up, but only like 50 people turned up. And so that had a massive knock on effect to like the meetings and, and, and because the, the, the model, similar to ours we've made some quite big changes um um but it was around basically guaranteed one to one meetings with sure. the group that's going to be there um and so it had a massive knock on effect and the guy like hid like rather than like owning it and just be like right what can we do like he like went missing and um and it was just so embarrassing so then when we left um um i i basically thought right this is it like 
So yeah, at this point, your if you could, if anybody could read your CV at this yeah. point, it would be rather disjointed from the age of what eighteen to what twenty four now. Up, yeah, down, yeah. up, so down, I, up, down. Why did you leave there after two months? Why did you leave there? You'd have a lot, of, lot of explaining uh, to do, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, and I wouldn't have employed me no way on the back of my CV. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I thought, oh, if this idiot can do it, then you know I can do it. And so I then, um, within two days, got the investment I needed, and and literally. Uh, you know, I got 20 grand, um, to start the business. And like I said, you know, we're now what, 19, 20 months later. And we've, we've literally turned over just now a million pounds. Um, and so you see, it is possible guys. It is possible. It is possible. It is possible. And it's about, um, what is it about? Dedication, um, Dedication. drive, um, knowing your market, being different, um, understanding the, the chat, basically taking, taking what's good. Yep. Removing the bad and then expanding and adding our own spin. So like, like both of these, like previous companies, they, they, they still do like a speed dating element where literally you like, you go around the room and you like pitch like, 10 tables in a row like maybe I've been to those events yeah and, and, and I can tell you it hurts it's just noise though you know it is the, noise the, the, the delegates that are there are literally listening to pitch after pitch after pitch after pitch and they cannot remember what's been said by who the room's so noisy same with the, the, same with the, the sponsors or the, the, the tech companies or whatever it might be um, that are then doing the pitching so like we like change that so we do um uh, what we call our Dragon's Den speed presentation session. So that's like 10 a.m. first thing, day one. Sure. And each sponsor gets up onto the main stage in front of the whole group and delivers like a two, three minute elevator style pitch about yeah. who they are and what they do but to everyone. And then we make it nice and easy for the delegates. It's got a list of the logos of the companies in order of appearance. We tick boxes next to them and says, if what they say resonates with you, please tick the box next to them and then remind yourself to have a chat with them during the business meeting sessions. Um, we've really reduced the numbers down, so we only want 100 people there. We don't want to scrape the barrel and, and get who we can. Mm. We want 100. Quality. Yeah, quality over quantity Most massively. Um, and so if you look at our delegate list, are honestly unbelievable. Um just because they are literally full of chiefs and directors exclusively and, and a very, very small portion of it um, where that's you know appropriate and, and applicable. Um, and so, um, and then, and the same with the delegate, you know, sponsor numbers, we want to bring together 20 sponsors rather than exhibition numbers, 50, 60, hundred, whatever it plus. That's, that's, that's brilliant. So that, these are your USP stuff. Yeah, so absolutely. I know Jack is so honest and authentic that if I leave him on the microphone, he's going to basically give you guys out there his whole business plan. And I'm, not, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that to him. No, 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 no. Um, Thank you, Jack, for being so honest throughout the conversation. Do you have any sort of take home messages for anybody aspiring to go into sales or I think you know, just go on, or being mini you? Being mini me. Um, I think that you've got to have an, a, a massive belief in yourself. Like, if you don't believe in yourself, then no one else will. Um, and, you know, I trust myself. So people say it was a risk to start out my own business. Now, I thought it was more of a risk for me to stay employed by someone else because I trust that person less than I trust me to deliver for me. Wow. See, that's that's big. You have to say that again. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'll break that down a bit more. So basically, I trust myself 100% that I will achieve my goals. Yeah. If I work for someone else, there is a risk that they might run the business poorly financially or operationally or not have their processes right or whatever. And the exactly. business, whether it's, and I'm not just about talking about going under, but I'm talking about my happiness. I'm talking about me being promised commission that I might not receive yeah. or whatever it might be. Right. Um, I trust myself more than I trust and, and I trust my own ability more than I trust anyone else's. That's and I think, is. and I think it's a case where you've got to have that, 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 that belief in yourself that you will achieve your goals um, and understand and be patient with it too, you know? And, and some people will say, Oh, you know, you've, you, people would like strive to hit that million. Mm -hmm. We've just started. Yeah. We have just started and, and public sector is our market. Now then we'll go into the private sector and so on. So um, as you can probably tell, I talk a lot. So yeah, you um, talk a lot of valuable lessons there. And again, for me, just listening and contributing wherever I can, it's very, very inspiring. Um, Thank you, Jack, for um, spending your time on this show. 
we wish you all the luck in the future thank you mate thank um, you for having me really really appreciate it it's been, been good fun yeah and if you want to link up with Jack I'm going to put all the information in our show notes go to www.themicedropclub.com website have a safe week people we out thank you for listening Don't forget to check out MikeDropClub.com and get the show notes and useful links. Subscribe to the podcast. Don't just live life. Make life boom.